the Valley of Vision. And this one is titled Living for Jesus. So would someone read this for us, please? O Savior of sinners, thy name is excellent, thy glory high, thy compassions unfailing, thy condescension wonderful, thy mercy tender. I bless thee for the discoveries, invitations, promises of the gospel, for in them is pardon for rebels, liberty for captives, health for the sick, salvation for the lost. I come, I come to thee in thy beloved name of Jesus, Reimpress thy image upon my soul. Raise me above the smiles and frowns of the world, regarding it as a, as a light thing to be judged by men. May the appropri appropriation be my only aim. Thy appropriation be my only name. Thy word my own, my one rule. Make me to abhor the the Holy Spirit. You suspect, suspect consolation to the worldly nature. To shun a careless, careless way of life to be proved evil, to instruct with meekness those who oppress me, to be gentle and patient towards all men, to be not only a professor but an example of the gospel, displaying in every relation, office, and condition, in excellency, loveliness, and advantage. How little have I illustrated my principles and improved my privileges? How seldom I serve my generation. How often have I injured and not recommended my sit my redeemer? How few are those blessed through me? And many things I have offended, and all come short of the glory. Pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Amen. All right. Comments on this? Anything stand out? Anyone? <laughs> it almost. You feel you almost feel like that jailer. Yeah. <laughs> what must I do to be saved? What must I do? Well, yeah. Yeah. Must I do? <clears throat> the good news is we don't have to do all this stuff to be saved. That's, it. Mm -hmm. that's, right. that's the good news. But it is an example of examination, right? Yes. And examining yes. yourself before God, like when you do before communion, they tell you, yeah. examine yourself. Um, but, and it's a good reminder of that because how many times do we actually do that during the day? Do we examine what we're doing? Um, is, it, is it helpful? Uh, be a good example of the gospel. How I've not recommended Christ to others and um, how much I've offended people. Yeah. But you know, if you're not in Christ, this has a completely different meaning. Even if you read it, right. it has a completely different meaning if you're mm -hmm. not in Christ because you're looking at these things as things that we would work towards. Mm -hmm. So it has a com completely different spin if you're not in Christ. A great reminder because how often I'm not gentle and patient towards mm -hmm. all men. <laughs> Well, I like the way he arranged this systematically. He starts with all prayers should start with praise. Mm -hmm. Thy name is excellent, thy glory is high, compassions, mm -hmm. condensation wonderful, and mercy is tender. So he's, he starts with a, a statement of praise. Then he thanks, he's thanks to God for the gospel. And what does gospel do? It pardons, liberates, it brings help, it brings salvation. Then he turns around and he gets down to the sanctification part, okay? <laughs> Uh, we make the gospel in me abhor the things of the, the flesh uh, to shun a careless way I like to reprove evil. So the gospel does good things and then it helps me abhor the hate the things that I that are part of my flesh in that. And it goes on. I think that's pretty neat. You could, uh, you could take one. If you didn't have a sermon, you could take one of these, pray and preach. <laughs> so it's really good. Well, is there anything else? Alrighty, in that case, uh, we will turn this over to our teacher, Dennis, and uh, let me just say a quick prayer first this morning. Father, I just thank you for this class. I thank you for Deuteronomy. Uh, sometimes it's a book where you go like, oh, Deuteronomy, but your word and it's precious to us. So please bless us and please bless them this morning as we dig into the study of Deuteronomy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We were a little hectic this morning. Ron.
So let me try. Everybody see that okay? Marilyn, can you see it okay? All right. Um, we didn't have any power in the room to get started today. The circuit breaker had went. I don't know if maybe if there was a little power surge through the night. Uh, there were storms yeah, apparently. Storms. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And uh, so possibly that's what the what the issue was. Um, we're going to look at the author of Deuteronomy. We're doing things a little bit differently. We have a different microphone. Hopefully, it's going to pick us up better throughout the uh, um, uh, throughout the class. We'll see how that works. We uh, we just have a short cord on it this week. I think we can put it closer, you know, more in this, uh, next week when we have another uh, piece of cable. So anyway, um, that's what we're going to be looking at, and um, without. Waiting any longer, let's go to RC. We're returning to our study of Deuteronomy, trying to discover what uh, God has for us there in this uh, very remarkable book. We talked about some of the uh, problems that separate us from the book of Deuteronomy, that it seems irrelevant, that it can seem uh, kind of shapeless, and we tried to take a look at uh, the shape of Deuteronomy last time, arguing that it's uh, really a kind of step pyramid very carefully constructed. And uh, uh, it's important to see that because for a long time in the 19th and through a good deal of the 20th century, there were liberal scholars who said, oh, Deuteronomy is written very late in the history of the Old Testament. Oh, Deuteronomy certainly was not written by Moses or anywhere near the time of Moses. Uh, Deuteronomy reflects a, a late religion. And uh, now through further literary studies through more archaeological studies, uh, even liberal scholars are having to recognize the coherence of Deuteronomy and the uh, at least possibility that Deuteronomy was written early uh, by Moses or at the time of Moses. And so a lot of what was absolutely scientific scholarship, absolutely assured in the 19th and 20th century has now been uh, overturned even in liberal scholarly circles. So it's uh, always encouraging for us. We're returning to our study of Deuteronomy, trying to discover what uh, God has for us there in this uh, very remarkable book. We talked about some of the uh, problems that separate us from the book of Deuteronomy, that it seems irrelevant, that it can seem uh, kind of shapeless, and we tried to take a look at uh, the shape of Deuteronomy last time arguing that it's uh, really a kind of step pyramid, <coughs> very carefully constructed. And uh, uh, it's important to see that because for a long time in the 19th and through a good deal of the 20th century, there were liberal scholars who said, oh, Deuteronomy is written very late in the history of the Old Testament. Oh, Deuteronomy certainly was not written by Moses or anywhere near the time of Moses. Uh, Deuteronomy reflects a a late religion. And uh, now, through further literary studies, through more archaeological studies, uh, even liberal scholars are having to recognize the coherence of Deuteronomy and the uh, at least possibility that Deuteronomy was written early uh, by Moses or at the time of Moses. And so a lot of what was absolutely scientific scholarship, absolutely assured in the 19th and 20th century, has now been uh, overturned, even in liberal scholarly circles. So it's uh, always encouraging for us as the people of God to find support for our faith. We believe the Word of God, whether we had uh, support for it or not, but we believe our faith is not irrational. Our faith is not against science or against the truth. And uh, what we discover is that in time, the validity of the Word of God is more and more demonstrated among us and uh, that is an encouragement. So Deuteronomy says very clearly that um, Moses was the author of Deuteronomy. Moses was the preacher of this sermon. And of course, some of the liberals said very knowingly, well, the end of Deuteronomy records the death of Moses. Did Moses record that? And oh, that's really clever. No, of course, uh, uh, the end of Deuteronomy was added by somebody else. Uh, uh, no one uh, needs to have any trouble about that. And, um, but we can have, I think, great confidence that uh, Moses himself was the author of Deuteronomy and prepared it with uh, a very clear purpose in mind 
uh, for the people of God. The people of God were standing east of the promised land. They had not yet crossed the Jordan. They had already conquered some of the land that would form the promised land east of the Jordan. But clearly the crossing of the Jordan was going to be a critical moment for Israel in terms of its entrance in the promised land. And this sermon is a preparation by Moses for Israel to undertake that crossing of the promised land, but not under the leadership of Moses anymore, but under the leadership of Joshua. So this is a sermon that's encouraging. This is a sermon that's preparatory. This is a sermon that's focusing on the transition of leadership. It's a long sermon. We talked about that last time, some five hours long. Um, and presumably, most of them didn't have seats. Uh, when, you, when you think of that, it's, uh, it's really remarkable. Um, but here, Moses is preparing people for the entrance into the promised land and this crucial new stage in their life. In some ways, we could say this is a farewell sermon. Um, preachers, when they're moving from one church to another, or a preacher who's retiring sometimes preaches a farewell sermon. And in that farewell sermon, often he's trying to think of all the things that he thinks this particular people still needs to know. Uh, what are the things that I'd like to leave them with in particular since I know them? Well, Moses knew these people. He knew they were needy. He knew they were stubborn. And we'll see, uh, yeah, some yeah, push in this book. Um, we'll see... One of the recurring words in this book is be careful, be careful, be careful. In fact, if we're attentive, we may get tired of being told to be careful. Uh, why does Moses repeat that so often? Well, because this is a careless people. They need to be told to be careful. Now, that's what he wants to concentrate on. And so I think it's good for us to be attentive um, to what uh, Moses is saying and to remember that we as the people of God are also called to be uh, careful. Uh, Paul, in writing to the Ephesians in uh, chapter 5, um, at verse 15, says, look carefully then how you walk. Uh, again, we see I think Paul probably has Deuteronomy in mind when he writes that, or at least much of the Old Testament in mind when he writes that. We too are to be a careful people. It's a problem for the church today that so much of the church is careless. We can talk about that maybe as we go along. But uh, uh, the, the call to carefulness has not ended with the Old Testament. Um, and that's why I think we'll find this book helpful. Now, what is the title of this book? In... Uh, um, in our English Bibles, it's titled Deuteronomy, uh, which is taken from the Greek, meaning the second law. Uh, and it was titled that because uh, this is the second giving, a second giving as a summary of the law. Uh, sometimes it's been called the fifth book of Moses, because the first four books maybe are the first summary of the law, and uh, here in Deuteronomy, we have the second summary of the law. Uh, in Exodus chapter 20, we have the Ten Commandments. And here in Deuteronomy chapter 5, we'll see we have the t Ten Commandments repeated again with slight variation. We'll want to look a little bit on why there's a slight uh, variation there. So that's why the church historically has often thought of this as the Deuteronomy, the second book of the law. In uh, Hebrew, as is the characteristic uh, practice of Hebrew, the book is just named by the first words of the book. That used to often be done. Um, um, books often didn't have titles. They just were known by their first words. And uh, in medieval uh, libraries, they were cataloged according to what was called the incipit. Incipit is Latin for it begins or it began. Uh, and so the first words are the title of the book. Um, 
If we went back and looked at lex yesterday's lecture, I suppose uh, the title of this would have to be Today. I think that's the first word I used. Uh, not very informative about what we're going to actually be doing. Uh, in, in the Hebrew Bible, this is known as the book of These Are the Words, because those are the first words of the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, and if we went just a little farther, these are the words of Moses. That's a little more helpful. Uh, this is the great farewell sermon of Moses as he speaks to the people, as he speaks to the people about leadership and leadership under the law. Um, one of the things one could study in the history of uh, mankind is how much leadership has been lawless. But when we get at the very center of the book of Deuteronomy, when we get to the apex of our uh, step pyramid, when we come to the middle of chapter 17 of uh, Deuteronomy, what do we find? We find instructions to the king, the king who will come. It will be hundreds of years before Israel has a king, but already Moses is preparing for the coming of the king. And what is the king told here at the center of this sermon, which in many ways is on leadership? Moses writes in Deuteronomy 17, verse 18, And when he, the king, sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers and that he may not turn aside from the commandments. Um, kings in Israel were to be men under law, under authority. Uh, and the king was to make for himself a copy of the law and to keep it by him all the days of his life, to read it all the days of his life and to follow it all the days of his life. And the king wasn't even to be trusted to make a reliable copy. Can you imagine? I'm, I'm a king and I'm copying out the, uh, the rules of this book and then I come to a law and I think, huh, I don't like that one so much. I'm going to leave that one out. Uh, well, after he makes his copy, the priests are to read that copy and make sure that it's accurate. One might almost say here we have separation of powers. Uh, there's no absolute kingship in Israel. A king serves God under his law for the well-being of his people. But what we also see here, you see, that Moses is stressing is the people of God need faithful leaders. The people of God cannot go it on their own. Um, the history of Israel was so <coughs> the people aren't very faithful, and of course the leaders aren't very, always very faithful. Um, but it reminds us in the church how critical it is to have faithful leadership in the church. How tragically the church has gone astray when there have been teachers that have not taught according to the Word of God. Particularly when they've had teachers that have lifted themselves up above the brethren and above the law. Um, it's interesting, the word in Hebrew for being proud is lifted up. And a form of pride, then, is to think, I'm better than others. I'm better than the Word of God. And what we see in the history of the church over and over again is leaders who lift themselves above the Word of God and don't pay attention to it. Moses is laboring that point, that it should not be so among the people of God, that the proper leadership in the people of God is to be a leadership that submits to the Word, that submits to God, that submits to His law and to His covenant. So that's what we're going to see as, as we go along. So that's our sort of introduction to the book, and now we actually get to the book and uh, to its beginning and how it, uh, it, it takes off, if you will. And uh, there Moses uh, seems to fulfill all our worst fears about uh, Deuteronomy, talking about all sorts of strange things and strange events and um, strange places. But 
In verse 2 of Deuteronomy chapter 1, it's, it's really remarkable and we shouldn't miss it. Um, Moses wrote, it is 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. Gripping, isn't it? Isn't that, uh, would you like to hear a sermon on that text? Uh, but pause and think a minute. Horeb is the word Moses in Deuteronomy uses to describe Sinai. So Israel came out of Egypt. They came to Mount Sinai. They received the covenant and the law of God. And they traveled 11 days to Kadesh Barnea. And at Kadesh Barnea, God said, now we're going into the promised land. Now we're going into the land flowing with milk and honey. Now we're going into the land where you will have rest from all of your enemies. Eleven days from Sinai. And Israel said, oh, I'm not so sure about this. Um, how could the Lord give us the promised land? How do we know he's strong? <coughs> Ten plagues on Egypt. Dividing the Red Sea, drowning Pharaoh and all his hosts, hadn't demonstrated any kind of strength. But now we're beginning to see the, the character of this people. And uh, before we feel too smug, we, we need to look at our own hearts and ask, how much trouble do we have trusting the promises of God? But here, Israel, just 11 days from, from Sinai, says, well, let's send spies into the land to really check out what this land is like. The Lord agrees to that. And so the spies go off, you know the story, and the spies come back, and there were 12 spies, and 10 of them say, oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. That's, that's a rich people. That's a powerful people. That's a strong people. Those are strong cities. They have walls around them. There's no way we can conquer that people. That's not the way we want to go. And two spies said, it is a wealthy land. It is a, it is a strong land. But the Lord has given us a promise that we can enter it, that we can succeed. And so let's do that. And the people say, no, we're not going. It's too much for us. And of course, when Israel says it's too much for us to trust the promise of God, what they're really saying is it's too much for God. And the Lord was not pleased. And he said, all right, if you will not go up and take this land, then you may not go up and take the land. And what happens? Israel says, oh, all right. They're, they're almost like children. Those of us who have raised children have seen attitudes like this. <laughs> oh, all right, if I have to. Well, it's too late. The Lord isn't playing games with his people. And so the Lord says, no, you would not go up. You would not put your trust in me. You would not believe my promise. Now you may not go up. Well, said the people, we are going up. And so they go off to fight. Who do they fight? They fight the Amorites. Now, the Amorites are not a people we often think about. Uh, they're not a people we return to frequently. But it's worth here at the beginning of Deuteronomy keeping that in mind. They fight the Amorites, and they are defeated, as the Lord had warned them. Uh, the Lord kept that promise. The Lord keeps his promises. And so here, Israel is defeated and is condemned to wander in the wilderness 40 years. 11 days, and they would have been on their way to entering the promised land. But because of their unbelief, it's 40 years before they will enter the promised land. And um, it's remarkable. It's remarkable to see how the Lord is serious about his word and about punishing this unbelieving people. He says, all of the adults in this people will die before you enter the promised land. And only the two faithful spies, Joshua and Caleb, will enter the land. 
Now, it's probably worth pausing here to say one of the problems people have in our time with the book of Deuteronomy is the violence in the book of Deuteronomy, is the death in the book of Deuteronomy. And, and we can't gloss that over. We can't ignore that. Uh, God is putting his whole, a whole generation of his people to death for their disobedience. Is that fair? Is that kind? Is that gracious? Is that merciful? Well, he's teaching us something. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 says this was written to us as an example. And part of what God is teaching here is God is really serious about his word. Uh, the, the, the spiritual life, the Christian life, the biblical life, biblical religion is a serious business. And if we find it troubling that a generation dies physically, we have to pause and ask how serious is it that many generations die spiritually? Uh, in other words, the destruction of the enemies of God in the Old Testament is always a picture of the seriousness of sin and the seriousness of judgment and the reality of judgment. I think God intends us to be disturbed by this. I think God intends us to be upset by this. And what we're going to see is, right here in these early chapters, is that one of the ones who dies in the wilderness because of sin is Moses. Moses longs to see the promised land. Moses longs to lead the people into the promised land. Moses longs to cross Jordan to the other side. He prays for that. Here's the great servant of the Lord in the Old Testament. And, Lord, and the Lord says, no, you may not enter. Why? Because you did not hold me holy before the people. Well, that's not fair, is it? You know, one of the things the Old Testament does is to readjust our notion of fairness, to challenge our notion of fairness, and to really press on us, are we a people of the book, or are we the people who invent our own religion? If you don't like parts of the Old Testament, you can cut them out and throw them away, and there are churches that will welcome you but you'll no longer be a biblical Christian. The Bible readjusts our notion of fairness. The Bible is not saying that Moses perished everlastingly. I don't think the Bible is saying that all those generation in the wilderness that died in the wilderness perished everlastingly. But their physical death was a statement to the people of God and to the world and to us that sin has consequences that sin will be judged, and that the judgment is severe. And it helps us think a little bit about Jesus on the cross, doesn't it? The death of Jesus on the cross is not a game. It's, it's not an occasion for a Hallmark card. It's not nice. It's a horrible thing that should cause us to recoil. And the judgment of God in the Old Testament helps us to see how serious the judgment of God is on his own son on the cross as he bears our sins. It's serious. And the Old Testament is preparing that, us for that. And uh, uh, that, that's why I think it is really valuable to, to read a book like Deuteronomy from time to time to get our, our notions of right and wrong and fairness readjusted. And so um, Moses is speaking to this people. He's not going to be able to join them. And he's reflecting in these early chapters of Deuteronomy on the past. What have we gone through together? What do we need to learn from what we've gone through together? And interestingly, at verse 9, uh, he thinks back to earlier days leading them through the wilderness and talks about how he had to get help and how judges were appointed to help him. 
And again, this is one of those places we, when you think, why is he talking about that in Deuteronomy chapter 1? You know, this might be something to talk about later in the book. Um, but here, we're about to enter the promised land. Moses is about to die. All these big things are happening. And all of a sudden, he stops to talk about leaders of 50 and leaders of 100 and leaders of 10 and how they were appointed. And See, I told you there was a lot of junk in this book. No. He's pointing already to the fact that this book is very much about leadership. How he was never a fully adequate leader. While he needed, how he needed help with leadership. And this book is going to go on to talk about how God is providing help for leadership. Um, and, and that should, should help us to think, too, how, how important leadership is in our churches. Uh, we, we maybe recognize how important preaching is in our churches, but it's not just about preaching. It's about the whole life of the church. The work that elders and deacons do as well is, is crucial in the leadership uh, of the church, and, and this book is pointing to that. This book is encouraging it. And also we find very early in this book, uh, verse 4, that... Uh, Moses was speaking to these people after he had defeated Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan. Sihon and Og. Some of you may be of childbearing years yet. You may want to name children Sihon and Og. No, nobody would name children Sihon and Og. Why would we even think about these people? Who are they? They're Amorites. Remember I told you to remember the Amorites? The Amorites defeated... Israel, when they stood at Kadesh Barnea, 11 days away from Sinai, and now 40 years later, they're right back, not far from where they began, and they're fighting the Amorites, Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og. And the Lord is now giving his people victory. We remember Sihon and Og not because they're the most pe important people in the history of the world, but because they mark the point where Israel moved from defeat to victory, where Israel moved from retreat to entrance into the promised land. And so we find in Psalm 135, 136, a celebration of Israel's victory over Sihon and Og. They're still celebrating that because it's important. God is giving Israel victory, and we'll go on to see more about this history next time. Any, uh, any comments, anything that uh, you heard in here that uh, challenges your thinking or reinforces something that you already had considered? Well, he brought in, not back in, in, in the conditions of mm -hmm. And there's, uh, I think it was, I forget which which was killed or somebody. But anyhow, there's a saying the apostasy begins in the church at the board of elders. Mm -hmm. That's how important it is to have a leadership in the church. Yes. Yes. Um, and unfortunately, apostasy oftentimes is not intentional at the beginning. That's true. It winds up being uh, subtly introduced. Um, and um, then it begins to you know, sort of take on a life of its own. And so that's why you know, we are, we are uh, in, particularly in, in writings, we are warned against false teachers. So we have to be very careful about our leadership. Now, what were some of the things he, he said in here about what leadership should look like, what a leader should be? 
it's biblical. I mean, he should be following the word of God. Right, right. Biblical. Moses wasn't, no, he wasn't doing that. Was it? Was it so much Moses? Was it so much Moses, or the people weren't listening? Well, uh, didn't Mo Moses have all these little leaders? You know, I mean, he had him and all these other people, yeah. and they weren't listening to them either. Right. right? The people weren't listening to it. Right. The yeah, they they. Uh, put on place. And I think one of the things that he's saying here is, you people need to listen. Right. You people need to listen. You need to listen to what the teaching is, because your teachers, I believe, are being faithful. You know, so how does that work its way out in the church? Well, what that means is the leaders need to be kept accountable, but those being led have to be accountable. And, uh, so often the subtlety of, of false teaching happens because somebody is not being faithful. And sometimes it can start with a, a small group of people. Uh, the church that we grew up in, um, the pastor was a weak leader. I asked him one time because I'd go in and talk to him and he would be talking about you know, I, I believe that you need to have Jesus to be saved. And yet he allowed liberals to push agendas in the church. And these the liberals had, you know, uh, our youth group was growing. Kids were coming to know Christ. And the liberals said, it's too emotional. <laughs> it's too emotional. And uh, uh, eventually that you <clears throat> left that church and worked on its own independently. So you can see pressures in the world, the world pushing in on, and I don't much watch, watch basketball, period. But Oral Roberts, I think it's Oral Yes, Roberts, yes, it's a good example. And, and they're getting, because they say man, marriage between a man and a woman, et cetera, yes. et cetera. And they're getting pushed by the NCAA. The oh, well, you, all the uh, people are hatred. It, it's it, it's kind of pushing. Well, they did play and they did lose. <laughs> yeah, at least they were <laughs> they, Yeah, they played this the point. But they only lost by two. It was like yeah. seventy-two. Whether to they seven. won or lost, <clears throat> hopefully yeah. they stick to do what they're. What they're oh doing. yeah, they will. They will. I mean, it's it, there's no question that they will. I mean, they've been around for years, and that's and it's good that they will. Because that will set the example and be able to say, look, you can't push us this way. You can't push us this way. So there's, a, uh, there, there's just a lot of subtle ways that, that leadership gets undermined. But the big thing about leadership, and I just wrote this, uh, this note, what is a faithful leader? S submission to God, to the brothers, brethren, and to the word, not necessarily in that order. I have an example of failed leadership. Um, in our early days, uh, we were in New Covenant in New York, which was a um, powerful church initially. There were five of us elders, myself, four others. Uh, and what happened to make this real, I don't want to take the time, but Russ was kind of like the lead elder. Well, his wife got sick, was dying of cancer. She wanted to go back to Georgia, where they were from. They put their son, who was 22 years old, in charge of the 600 member church. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened was after a period of time, this church really started falling apart and the young fellow decided to build his kingdom instead of God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. So when the whole thing fell apart, we got together in my friend Khalil Benora's house, who's one of our uh, leading elders. We had, a, we had a time of prayer all afternoon and the five of us were sitting there who were the ex-elders in this church. And Bob McCann, he's now uh, pastoring in Ireland. Bob just in a prayer, he said, Lord, he says, forgive us, Father, all of us. Forgive us for fearing men more than we feared you. And mm. the bomb went off in the room. And we all looked at this is Dr. Charles Perry. These are men who could pray. We looked at each other and said, that was us. Nobody meant to do anything wrong, but little by little, we seeded leadership in this 22-year-old person who became the set man and ran the church, and the church grew mm. up. And we looked at each other and said, I thought it was us. Yeah. When I remember that prayer, Bob just casually said, Lord, forgive us for fearing men more than you. 
Matt was the leader of the five of us in leadership in that church. We never meant to do it. We loved the Lord, but we didn't say enough when we should have said enough. We yeah. let it go. Like the like he's pointing out here, 11 days after they saw the, the Egyptians being drowned and all that and everything. And then who are they fearing? They were fearing man. Or they would go out and do all these things. What more? It's, it's, well, we're all susceptible, I think. Sin is crouching at your door. Yeah. It's ours for you. What were, two, what were the two words that he said that... Um, Be careful. Be careful. Because very, very true. In everything you do, <laughs> be careful. Be careful. Um, true. And, and you yeah, know, I mean, that is so true for every level of a believer, whether it's an elder, whether it's uh, a parishioner, whether uh, be careful, and we need to be careful in every aspect. Um, or you know, our our witness can go out the window. You know, our our uh, relationships can break down. You know, in reading um, R.C.'s biography, um, when uh, he was very close friends. Um, and, uh, and, and they were each on each other's boards, very close. And um, then there was a, uh, a document that came out, probably around, I'm trying to think what it was, but it, it, it embraced evangel oh, evangelicals and Catholics together. And it was a document that said, we're together. On things, and it, it went far beyond the things that we agreed on, such as abortion, you know, and and and, and uh, those types of things that we agreed with the Roman Catholics. But it went beyond that and accepted what the Roman Catholics were saying about salvation and how you would be saved. And of course, the the Roman Catholics, their 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 position on justification is different than ours and it's not biblical so rc would not sign the document did you read his book faith alone you wrote a whole book on it which is exactly what yes. he's talking about yeah and 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 he um uh but in trying to really reconcile the situation it couldn't be done because colson and several others that he was that he was close to would not be careful. And so uh, it, it ended pretty much the relationship. Colson and, and Sproul left each other's boards. You know, um, RC took a lot of heat over it. But again, it's a thing, be careful. Now, part of, part of, um, part of what was going on with RC might have been Back in the days when we were fighting the battles in the United Presbyterian Church and seeing where they were wrong, and of course that, when I say United Presbyterian, since they've actually merged and they're the PCUS, the Southern Presbyterian Church is merged with them, so they're one. But the battles that we were involved in, when we were standing up and saying no to this, no to this liberalism that's coming into this, this Unitarianism, this universalism that we on Thursday nights, Wednesday night this week. But the, the whole thing is the secularization of society has created problems. And, um, and, and the standing up against that is what's going to really be the litmus test over the next few years as to what happens with the church. If we allow the, the, the government to do the things that they're saying they're going to do in order to allow um, people that don't agree with us to control us, then we're not being careful. 
we're not being careful and we're going to see the the demise of the church as we know it well jesus gave us an example in the gospel of john uh, in chapter six on a whole uh, dissertation on the bread and uh the assuming reading that that a significant number of his followers packed up and left mm -hmm. and jesus didn't run after him wait 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 come back come back i didn't mean that right he goes to the disciples and said where do you stand but he let him go yeah i think that's going to happen to the church okay because the church is god's property not ours god will deal yeah what did he say about when he sent the disciples out and said you go to go to people's homes if they don't welcome you dust your sandals off and leave you know get out get out get away from there i, I might be wrong but i think Correct me, but I think it was in Chicago, wherever they were, of course, he literally stood on top of the table and told them about that. He said, This is this evangelicals and evangelicals and Catholics together. Yes. Yeah, he, oh, he, was, he made a stand. I have a soft spot in my heart for Catholic. Absolutely. My family was Catholic, and I would love for, for a reunification, but it's not going to happen. Sproul says in his book, once they wrote, um, uh, Council of Trent and wrote down these things of Pope. They mm -hmm. cannot renege on that, and they can't write another encyclical overruling that one. Yeah. Right. So they will never compromise on sure, faith yeah. alone for that. justification. They won't do it because yeah. they'll collapse. Yeah. But I wish yeah. it would be wonderful. But so Sproul says, if we want that fellowship, we have to abandon our principles, compromise our right. principles, and cross over the line. And he did. He went to town on Colson. And all yep. those signers of that yes. yes, he did. And uh, and of course, they went to town on him. <laughs> and the book, he says, you're about to undo the entire Reformation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, He's pretty strong. Yeah. Even at the end, he what's wrong with you people? Yeah. <laughs> He would say that about the people in his audience. Yes. What's wrong with you people? And see, he, he feared God more than he feared men, yes. which is our problem. Yeah. He could have went the easy route and everybody would have embraced him and loved him, right. but he said, hey, here I stand. Yeah. Well, see, he made a comment too. He said, I can walk hand in hand with a Muslim, a Catholic, or anybody protesting abortion, but I will not compromise the word of God. Yeah. And why? It's not because of some academic thing, gospel. But once you you take that away from the gospel, you lead thousands of people with you down the path to hell. That's right. And that that was was the real reason. Right. I'm sorry. That's all my right. book. That's faith right. alone. <laughs> You're not supposed to be there. We're returning to our. <laughs> hey, he's good. I'll listen. <laughs> <laughs> Just say one. He's he's a, he is such a good teacher. There we go. Um, these are, I, I don't want to go quite to these yet, but um, why does he talk about the kings in Deuteronomy? Because the kings are fairly far down the road yet. Why does he talk, talk about the kings? Well, he's preparing them for the leadership. And of course, the kings wound up being bad leaders, many of them. Or was he using the, the phrase kings in general for leadership? Um, well, uh, it's. So you think he's being prophetic at that particular time? Yes, moment? yes. I think, it, I think this is somewhat prophetic at this point. Um, and. Uh, How does the uh, how does death in Deuteronomy correspond to Jesus' death on the cross? Okay. Um, God is the horror of it. It's so awful. Okay, the horror of death. But it was so awful in Deuteronomy. There were thousands and thousands of people killed and slaughtered. In the yeah, and and um, for 
uh, you know, he, he said he didn't, you know, Moses died before he entered, uh, uh, you know, before he could enter the promised land. What he said was, I don't think Moses was not eternally saved, okay, but salvation for the Israelites was getting to the promised land. Mm -hmm. So when they had the situation where they refused to go, he's gone. And they were basically annihilated. Every one of that generation died before they went into uh, the promised land, with the exception of who? Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua. Because why? Because they believed. They said, we need to go do this now. We need to go do this now. Let's go do it. And the people refused. And um, of course, Moses had blood on his hands as part of you know the reason that he couldn't go in. So the idea of death, even for the believer, is there. Okay. Um, now, when we're talking about the Amorites, they were not believers. Uh, apparently, maybe maybe some were. I don't know. Could be. Could be. But they were. So the the whole thing of death is seen there. Now, how does that compare to what we find in the New Testament? How does that compare to what we see in the New Testament concerning death? What's the picture we're seeing in Deuteronomy that is in the New Testament? It's hard for me to follow the train. I'm trying to okay. Trying, I'm trying to get on the track here. Okay. So, well, okay, let's talk about it. Uh, in Deuteronomy, death. We talked about Moses' death, right? Moses wasn't condemned eternally, but the principle is that sin has consequences. Right. He paid the immediate sin consequences. Sin has consequences. Sin. So in the New Testament, sin still has consequences right. in death. Oh, yeah. yeah. Even for us believers, right. unless Christ returns before we die. Right. But we have the consequence of because of sin. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, Paul says that in Romans. Yes. The death entered in uh, yes. on, on, uh, on the back, on the coattail yeah. of uh, yes. Adam's sin. Yeah, there, that, that's, uh, that's what we're driving at. So now we're talking about there's death. We've got that figured out. Now, what about um, the idea that for salvation, for the, for for the Israelites to get what they wanted and and known was to go into the promised land, and everybody but this generation was able to go in into the promised land. So in the same sense, <clears throat> believers go into the promised land of heaven, the ultimate promised land, through the work of Christ. And what he did, his death, his resurrection, and his actually being resurrected, I think is all this picture of what we're seeing of the Israelites going into the promised land and having that life, even though it was not eternal, it was still a promised life that, that, that they had been given. We're given a promised life in Jesus. He, I'm glad he mentioned in there about he's of all the people that didn't go into the promised land. He can't say definitively they were right. eternal death. It's the same way. Lynn and I often go back and talk about the people in Sodom and Gomorrah went up in smoke. And I said, don't forget there were children and everything. Yeah. Now, I, I don't know. God has shown not the judge of all here if he was right. I mean, it, it, I don't know whether they all, all are eternal hell or, or eternal death, but that the whole Sodom and Gomorrah was an example of deserving it. Right. <laughs> They're like, well, who was it that Ananias and Sapphira? They lied. Bam. Yes. God struck them dead. Yeah. They in hell. Uh, we don't know. We don't know. Yeah, I mean, they were part of it. The... But it sure so, scared the people. So, wow. Yeah, <laughs> but they were part of the group, so they knew the message. Right. Right. Reformed exactly. theology would say they went to heaven. Pardon? Good reformed theology would say Ananias and Sapphira are in heaven. Because they were believers. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, he made a, a statement on there, I think, very important. He says the Bible readjusts our sense of fairness. Yes. Very yeah. important. Okay. Doesn't seem fair to me. The whole Old Testament. Kill them all. Kill the children. Kill, yeah. kill the animals. Kill everything God says. I'm like, wait a minute. Lord, what's going on here? And he's saying, this is my sense of fairness. Isn't it, isn't it sort of ironic? That uh, when our children say that's not fair, and yeah, fair. I know, but well, that's us. And we say, and we say, nobody said it was. No. <laughs> and so, but but how many times do we in our minds think life is just not fair? We have a sense of justice, yeah. and God has a sense of justice. Yes. The two don't always meet. Yes, that's a hard lesson for me to learn. All right, what part of Deuteronomy do scholars agree was not written? By Moses. One record of Moses. Yeah. yeah, I mean, hardly could he have written <laughs> by his pen. All right. What does the word Deuteronomy mean? Second law. The second law. Yeah. Which of these did Moses stress for leaders of Israel? Oh, I remember from grade school. Anytime it says all of the above, she said. Seventy-five percent chance you're right. <laughs> and um, I can't see it from over this way. How much time passed between Moses receiving God's law at Mount Sinai and the Israelites' doubt at the border of the Promised Land? How many? And the Israelites doubt at the border of the yeah, promised land. 11 days. 11 days. 11 days. What sin prevented Moses from entering the promised land? He destroyed the first from God. He did not honor God as holy before the people. He doubted that the Israelites could defeat the Amorites. He hesitated to turn over leadership to Joshua. Yes. He didn't, he didn't honor God as holy before the people. Uh, Moses and the first generation of Israelites died before entering the promised land, but that doesn't mean that they perished everlastingly. All right. Wow. I often wonder, should they have sent spies into the land? Why didn't they just say, look, God says our land, we're going to go possess it, let's get it and go. But they had to send out spies, which caused all the trouble. Right? Because one of the spies said, hey, man, we can't do it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> just wonder. Because yeah. well, God said, you're going to win. You're going to win. Go. God didn't tell them to do that. That's like Mom, that's like Abraham. God says, "Get thee up and take thee to a land I will show thee." He didn't say, "Hey, why?" Yeah. Look at all the trouble that happened. Yeah. Let's uh, let's pray. Our gracious heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this day that we celebrate uh, Jesus going into Jerusalem. It is indeed a joyous day uh, in the life of the church. Only to uh, within within a few days. Uh, plunge us into the darkest of times. And uh, we pray, Lord, that we are considering this week, we would uh, have a better understanding of uh, all these events and how they impact us and how they should impact us and really help us to look at ourselves and see how they don't impact us. And uh, we pray that you would just lead us and guide us and direct us. And again, we thank you for this series, we thank you that uh, we're getting a chance to really look at uh, at a book that maybe we uh, try to avoid sometimes. Um, but uh, Lord, we just uh, thank you again for your word. We pray that you'll be with us as we come to worship you now, Lord. And may we, uh, Hosanna in the highest, praise be to God, um, as as uh, as we celebrate today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I can think of that song. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna. Hosanna.
<laughs> we got to get you to a charismatic church. I know. I never. You used to wave the palms and dance around the aisles. Yeah, yeah, we're crazy. We were crazy. 